Okay. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, I would my pleasure to welcome you to the first session of today's uh, workshop conference in honor of uh, Professor Carolyn Merchant. Uh, this first panel, we have uh, three speakers, um, Jay Bert Calicott, Nancy Unger, and Ken Worthy, and uh, my job as chair will be to introduce each of them briefly. They will each have around 15 to 20 minutes to speak, and then we'll have some time for questions. So I'll do the introductions, and I will keep time. Okay. So our first speaker today is Jay Baird Calicott, who retired as University Distinguished Research Professor and Regents Professor of Philosophy at the University of North Texas in 2015. He is widely known as the founder of academic environmental philosophy. He is co-editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of Environmental, Environmental Ethics and Philosophy and author or editor of a score of books, among them Earth's Insights, a multicultural survey of ecological ethics from the Mediterranean Basin to the Australian Outback, published by UC Press in 1987, and author of dozens of journal articles, encyclopedia articles, and book chapters in environmental philosophy and ethics. Pass over maybe the microphone. Check that it's on. It is on. Um, thank you uh, for the uh, introduction. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be on the campus of such a great institution as the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I was very, very glad to hear last night uh, Carolyn uh, speak about her uh, former husband, Hugh Iltis, um, who uh, extra judicially, it seems, uh, set a prairie on fire. Uh, and uh, he, he was a, he was a firebrand uh, environmentalist, if I can continue the metaphor, uh, whom I knew uh, personally um, when I was um, at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. He would come up and uh, uh, Rouse the rabble uh, for uh, for environmental causes, um, and that's uh, that's germane to my uh, talk today because um, in the chapter uh, of the of the forthcoming, we don't call it a best trip, uh, the uh, book on uh, celebrating Caroline's uh, work. I'm focusing on the papers that she wrote under the name Carolyn Iltis and the title of my uh, contribution to after uh, the death of nature is before the death of nature, uh, the Carolyn Merchant that a few people know. And I'm going to read um, briefly just an excerpt from that uh, chapter. So here it goes, chatting with her at a dinner party in the mid-1980s, I told Carolyn that I had been a fan of hers since she was writing under the name Carolyn Iltis, and that would be from 1970 to 1977. She expressed vehement incredulity. But no, I protested. It was true. So when Ken Worthy invited me to contribute to the forthcoming book celebrating Carolyn's immense contribution to the environmental humanities, Finally, remembering that moment, I proposed focusing on her early papers written under that name. I was not a fellow specialist in the history of science, so Carolyn uh, had every reason to doubt that I would have encountered work of hers on such abstruse topics as the Beast Viva controversy, internal <laughs> living uh, force versus external impressed force, and Bernoulli's Springs, and that's the coil kind, not the hot kind. <laughs> uh, her work between 1970 and 1977, when she was writing as Carolyn Iltis, was squarely in the history of science, to be sure, but it was also just as squarely in the history of philosophy. For Iltis had a way of connecting the arcane technical issues on which she focused with the metaphysical and ontological issues in which I was interested. In 20th century Anglo-American analytic philosophy, metaphysics had practically lost all connection with its ancient Greek and early modern antecedents. 
and Anglo-American analytic philosophy of science was largely, if not exclusively, focused on scientific epistemology, and thus the metaphysical and ontological implications of science, both modern and postmodern, were almost entirely neglected. In the undead corpse of that tradition, uh, they still are. Uh, the great exception is the metaphysical foundations of modern physical science, a historical and critical essay by E.A. Burke published in 1924. I loved that book and still do, but precisely because it does focus on the metaphysics and ontology of modern physical science, it has received but a sniffy reception in 20th century uh, philosophy of science. My interest in Burke's work led me to take an interest in the work of Carolyn Iltis, who was doing what her contemporaries in philosophy of science were not. To what else was I to turn? And it's the work of Carolyn Iltis that laid the foundation for Carolyn Merchant's own great work, beginning with the publication of The Death of Nature, Women, Ecology, and the Scientific Revolution, in 1980, right through the publication of Autonomous Nature, Problems of Prediction and Control from uh, Ancient Times to the Scientific Revolution in, uh, in 2016, uh, when that book was published. I first learned of the papers of Carolyn Miltis, among them uh, the following most salient. Uh, among the things I learned from those papers, uh, the, the following most salient things. First, the so-called scientific revolution, which begins with Copernicus's De Revolu Revolutionibus in the 16th century and culminates with Newton's Principia in the late 17th, is a misnomer, or more precisely put, an anachronistic nomer. <laughs> I don't know when exactly science, the word, took on the meaning that it has today, but it took it on much closer in time to us than to Copernicus or even to Newton. In the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, what was going on was a revolution in Western natural philosophy. I have so far acceded to the convention and identified her field as the history of science, but also for the same reason that nomer is anachronistic for what Carolyn Iltis was doing in the 1970s. She was rather a historian of natural philosophy and one of the best um, uh, on our work. Second, the modern uh, revolution in natural philosophy uh, had a wide and long reach, touching practically everything else in the European and neo-European intellectual and cultural ambit, theology, ethics, politics, and economics running on pretty much right down to the present. And practically all of Carolyn Iltis's papers, the word worldview appears early and often. In short, the scientific revolution, the revolution in Western natural philosophy, resulted in a full tilt worldview transformation, which is at bottom what Carolyn Merchant's The Death of Nature is all about. Finally, third, I learned from Carolyn Iltis that a second scientific revolution has occurred, and that its architects, Einstein, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, among others, were the natural philosophers of the 20th century. Ours in the 20th, 21st, Brian Greene, Lisa Randall, Max Tegmark, among others, are ever advancing it. The metaphysics and ontology of the second scientific revolution are no longer Cartesian and Newtonian, no longer atomistic, mechanistic, and dualistic. 21st century uh, physics is indeed well on the way to jettisoning, jettisoning once and for all an atomistic ontology in favor of a relational field ontology. According to theoretical physicist David Tong, physicists routinely teach that the building blocks of nature are discrete particles, such as the electron or the quark. That is a lie. The building blocks of our theories are not particles, but fields, continuous, fluid-like objects spread throughout space. Apparently today, even in physics as in biology, an ontology of individuals is a hangover from the atomism invented by the Greek natural philosophy, the philosophers and revived by the moderns. As Iltis indicates, the ontology and metaphysics of contemporary natural philosophy is holistic or organic sense of merchant in the death of nature. 
quantum mechanics <coughs> exhibits genuinely holistic internal relations in the form of non-locality or entanglement in which a change in one subatomic particle, a structure in the underlying fields results in the ins instantaneous change in another, no matter how far apart the two are from one another. That really not, should not be so shocking precisely because particles are in fact locally excited states of the continuum of the fields of which nature is ultimately composed. Indeed, the natural world we inhabit is holistic and internally related all the way from the quantum mechanical <coughs> microcosm to the universal or maybe now multiversal uh, macrocosm. It certainly is here in the middle-sized range of the cosmos as the natural philosophers of evolutionary biology, ecology, and bacteriology tell us. Each species is shaped by its physical, chemical, and biological environments. It, each species is what it is because their environments are what they are. That's the meaning of internally related. And the organisms that make up biotic communities are internally related through the flow of energy and materials through their bodies, they being but moments in ecological processes. And biotic communities and their associated ecosystems are trans-organismic wholes. They are perhaps not as ontologically robust as they once were thought to be, but they are real nonetheless, as we discover to our regret and peril when they are compromised, diminished, or destroyed. Frederick Clements, the first dean of American ecology, portrayed what he called plant associations, later called biotic communities, when the associated animals are considered as superorganisms. And by super, he just meant big, reasoning that as tiny single-celled organisms associated to form much larger multi-celled organisms, so did multi-celled organisms associate to form much larger superorganisms. That idea is no longer viable in ecology, but recently the worm has turned, and we now regard multi-celled organisms as super ecosystems. And here the word super doesn't mean big, it means to, in a higher degree. The super ecosystems that are multi-celled organisms are more highly integrated than Clements ever imagined the objects of ecological study to be. In fact, the National Institutes of Health has initiated the Human Microbiome Project, a program tasked to map the human super ecosystem. According to Gasol and Perkins, this represents a recent paradigm shift in how we view the microbial world. We are constituted not only by our own cells, but by the microbial cells in and on us. They outnumber ours by an order of magnitude and represent thousands of species. Some are parasites, others commensals, and still others mutualists. Indeed, without the help of the mutualists, we would be unable to digest our food or ward off uh, harmful invasive microbes. <clears throat> and while biotic communities and their associated ecosystems are not, by the likes of current ecology, superorganisms, the whole biosphere, Gaia, most certainly is by the likes of Earth system science. Why then has the second scientific revolution or second revolution in natural philosophy that, that began more than a century ago not profoundly changed the prevailing worldview as did the first? Why do most Europeans and neo-Europeans still think of themselves as ghosts and machines, as externally related individuals? The very fabric of our being is in truth woven from our socio-environmental relationships, and yet many people seem not to notice. And that fabric is severely imperiled and palpably unraveling. It's as if leprosy were eating away at parts of their bodies, and as long as, say, their faces are unaffected, the vast majority of Europeans and neo-Europeans don't seem to notice and don't seem to care. Many, if not most, of our technologies, from TVs to cell phones, are manifestations of quantum field theory, just as steam and internal combustion engines were manifestations of Newtonian mechanics. Why, then, is the prevailing worldview and its associated politics and economics still Newtonian with all that that goes with it, as Iltis Merchant explains and as I have enveloped? 
Why is our worldview not responding as it did in the past? Where's the quantum mechanical, relativistic, evolutionary, ecological politics, economics, graphic arts, literature, music, religion? History suggests that worldview remediation is inevitable as natural philosophy entrains its motifs in new technologies and new social imaginaries. So maybe the real question is not why or why not, but when. And that leads to another. Do we have time for the great transition to cross a threshold, become irreversible, and develop rapidly before a different threshold is crossed and global climate change becomes irreversible, develops rapidly, and brings civilization in any form to an abrupt end? <clears throat> Thus, we are called to what Thomas Berry called the great work and what Carolyn is pursuing today with her sustainability project. Thank you very much. May I call on any questions or comments? Yes, the fact that the prairie burning was the first date. <laughs> <laughs> So did uh, Hugh burn any prairies up in Stevens Point? Uh, I, I think he burned a few uh, <laughs> provosts and uh, <laughs> university president, uh, presidents and deans and uh, politicians and so on, but uh, no prairies to my knowledge. Well, we burned many prairies during our marriage. <laughs> that was only the first one. <laughs> but he was, uh, he and Paul Olson started a chapter of the Nature Conservancy um, right around that time. Uh -huh. And we would go out um, to visit uh, farmers who had native prairie on their land. Mm -hmm. And I would go. <laughs> sex roles, I would go in the kitchen and talk to the wife, <laughs> and he would go out with the farmer and talk about why it's important to save this prairie and ask if he would donate it for a tax write-off to the Nature Conservancy. Mm. And then after they all agreed, we would go out and burn it. <laughs> <laughs> because prairies have to be maintained right. by burning. You have to keep the aspen and all the uh, plants that are supposed to be there. And that was what Native Americans did. Exactly. They burned and are allowed the prairies to burn. They maybe had no choice. But uh, anyway, that was um, so Wisconsin. Uh, it is famous due, due to you mm -hmm. of, of saving a lot of land and a lot of prairie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. It seems to me that um, you, you pointed out the new research in the microbiome and how that could um, ontologically and medically change our understanding of what it means to be human as, as beings of communities rather than autonomous individuals. Um, and so it seems to me that that should really shift how we think about ourselves. Are you seeing that starting to happen in philosophy and ethics? Well, um, in, in philosophy, in mainstream philosophy, no. Uh, mainstream Anglo-American philosophy has been incredibly uh, conservative, uh, refusing really to engage uh, with the natural sciences for the most part. Environmental philosophy is an exception to that, as in a few other fields such as uh, neuropsychology. But for the most part, uh, the conversations among philosophers are rather uh, sort of internally focused on uh, problems that are evolving and there's very little communication uh, with the uh, sciences. So one of the things that I have consistently written on now that uh, I'm retired and a little bit more free uh, to say what I really think, uh, and, and, that, and that is that 
that Anglo-American philosophy has to follow the uh, lead of um, environmental philosophy, neuro psychology and its relationship to philosophy and begin to look outward and engage the, the sciences and contribute what we philosophers can contribute to a, a larger sort of intellectual um, uh, wave uh, uh, that is progressing into the future. Well, I wrote a paper about Carolyn Archie. And when I did that, I wasn't particularly conscious of what the microbiota was in my stomach or her stomach. <laughs> the way in which uh, when I think about right and wrong, or when I think about the future of the planet, doesn't make that much difference to me. I know that there are a lot of critters inside of me that I need to stay healthy and some I need to get rid of. But that isn't heavily influencing my sense of whether a woman ought to be president of the United States or what I ought to think about environmental policy. You know, I don't have much sense of partnership with my intestinal parasites. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm doing this kind of activity. Do you? <laughs> the, the answer to that, Holmes, is yes. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, I do, and it's in a it's in a much larger context of uh, the my research, current research and project is a re is is an attempt to reconceive individuality in terms of relationships. But it, it, this is not a new idea. It's a sort of an extension of work that goes back to Arnie Ness and the ecological self, uh, to Paul Shepard uh, and others. Uh, and instead of conceiving our individuality in rugged terms, in atomistic terms, as being a kind of nexus in a network or a, 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 of relationships, Ness called it a knot in a field in the biospheric field or something of that sort. So we preserve our unique individuality, but that individuality is is de is defined by our concatenation of socio environmental relationships, and so that is just part of this larger scheme in which we want to conceive of ourselves uh, in relation to terms, not only in terms of the microbes in our gut, but the sort of thing that your very first paper, Holmes, I want to remind you, um, <laughs> is there an ecological ethic in which you're talking about being uh, up in the Colorado mountains and drinking the water. I'm not sure you should have, uh, <laughs> given your gut, but uh, that the, the water of the inlet is flowing through you. The fish that you just caught and ate is part of your identity, uh, and, and so on. So I just want to bring, bring you back to uh, <laughs> what, what I thought was among the most uh, brilliant contributions to the field. Uh, that very first paper. Well, I am in relation to my immediate surroundings. I got to drink water, and I've got to employ certain germs and so forth. Yes, all that's true. <coughs> Some of these relationships are much tighter and much simpler than others, or, or some of them so ordinary and ongoing, I assume my 
in front of the water and drank and a place to sleep. But much of what else I think doesn't seem to me to be much dependent on what those relationships are. But Barrett, I'm glad you have a good relationship with your gut bio <laughs> because you have answered the question of what. <laughs> All right, we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, two questions, if they're short, one if they're long. Okay. Um, yes. Um, so I was um, interested in your question about the, you know, why the second standard is a good one caught on. And I was thinking, well, the first one has a caught on still in a lot of places. They're <laughs> <laughs> still creationists and flat earthers and all that sort of thing. There's still views of people for whom the scientific narrative is not the primary narrative of their own um, native traditions or religious philosophy is. And some of those are actually ahead of this term to relationality. So, Maybe the maybe part of the answer is that the scientists should use, you know, the Buddhists and the Taoists and native philosophies in order to articulate to a wider audience sort of what this revolution might mean. Uh, thank you, Whitney. That is uh, precisely the theme of my uh, book, Earth's Insights, uh, that we uh, need to draw on the resources of um, non-scientific uh, religious and spiritual traditions uh, in order to articulate the uh, insights of uh, contemporary uh, science. And so, um, the, in fact, the most controversial chapter in that book was the idea that science in the 21st century, second scientific revolution, uh, is the glue that sort of holds all these uh, traditions together um, which, which was, I was accused of uh, reviving master narratives of, uh, uh, here, which I confess. That's where it's talking about my first was in the major class. One more question. Yeah. Just a quick comment. I was thinking about your um, question about that bio and said, I started thinking about food and the growing interest in food systems and how everything we eat is connected to a social structure, exploitation of the land, exploitation of the workers, and, and that's a way I think of understanding our relationship. Right. And yeah. you know it's partly connected to your right. guys. Yeah. An example of how that is actually beginning to manifest yeah. itself. Okay, thank you. Um, our next speaker Nancy Unger. Um, I'm just giving her a brief introduction. She will say the rest, but she is professor and chair of history at Santa Clara University. Are we in the way here? Should should I move? Oh, oh it's so huge. I don't. I, I think it's okay. Fine. Actually, what I would like to do is actually see the uh, oh, yeah. presentation. It's the biggest screen I've ever seen. <laughs> so this is uh, personal, political, and professional. The impact of Carolyn Birch's life and leadership. And just talking with a few people last night, I learned that I am just one of legions who have had my, my life and my career changed by Carolyn. So I just wanted to be one example. So I think this is quite an amazing event. Um, it's really something, isn't it, to see how much one life can affect so many other people's lives, uh, particularly how much one person's work. Julie? Where is Julie? Julia. It worked when we practiced. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's on slide. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that a problem? Yeah. 
There we go. Oh, thank you. Um, think of how much one person's work can mean and how much creativity it can spark. Look at all these books. And the way that Carolyn produces, I probably missed a couple that you know, she came out with while I was preparing this. Um, I met Carolyn Merchant in 1994 because I got laid off from my position as a lecturer in American history at San Francisco State University. Back when my hair was black. <laughs> and my uh, grading assistant had earned his undergraduate degree at Santa Clara University and suggested that I give its history department a call. Rather to my surprise, um, I learned that they were looking for a one-year sabbatical replacement. So during the interview, as was my habit, I lied my head off about all the things I was prepared to teach. Um, although my training is in the politics of the progressive era, I confidently agreed to all the courses they named. The colonies and constitution? Sure. <laughs> History of the American West? Of course. <laughs> A seminar on historical writing? Why not? <laughs> American women's history? California history? Refreshingly, I actually had some experience teaching those. But as accustomed as I was to saying yes first and scrambling to put the course together later, when I was asked if I could design the university's first environmental history class, I paused. The interview team explained that the coming academic year would feature a campus-wide institute on environment, and such a course would be a key component. This sounded like a challenge even for a how hard can it be adjunct like myself, who always believed that any teaching schedule, no matter how daunting, beat unemployment. But it wasn't until the next day that I called to confirm that yes, environmental history would be one of the six courses I was committed to teaching. And the minute I hung up, I hit the panic button. What had I done? <laughs> environmental history. I wasn't even sure I knew exactly what it was. Um, however, as an undergraduate, I had loved Rod Nash's Wilderness in the American Mind. And as a scholar of the Progressive Era, I was well versed, of course, in Theodore Roosevelt's conservation leadership. So I began casting about for books to assign. And I settled pretty quickly on uh, Bill Cronin's Changes in the Land and Don Worcester's Rivers of Empire. What I needed now was a core text. Pickings were relatively thin then, uh, particularly because I didn't want to sign another narrative. So fortunately, I found Carolyn Merchant's Major Problems in American Environmental History. I wanted my students and me to grapple with exactly what Carolyn's book provided, key documents and provocative essays. Reading Carolyn's book in preparation for my class was a marvelous introduction to the field. I quit feeling overwhelmed and intimidated because I was too busy being fascinated and challenged. And once the quarter began, the professor who was in charge of the Institute on Environment asked how my class was going. And I raved about Carolyn's book and about how much my students and I were enjoying debating the meanings of various documents and arguing over the different viewpoints presented in the scholarly articles. And I noted that Carolyn was just up the road at Berkeley and said wistfully that I, I wish she could come and talk to my class. This is what happens here at a private university. The professor said, well, why don't you invite her to come? The institute has a budget. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was that I met Carolyn Merchant. I was thrilled that such an eminent scholar was willing to come to our campus and was so pleased that my students were going to have a chance to interact with the author of the book that had spurred so much learning. And I expected her to be brilliant, which of course she was, but she was also funny and charming. <laughs> Not only did Carolyn captivate my students, but after her presentation, she took the time to talk to me about my career path. My children were young at that time, and I was really struggling to combine profession and family and worried that I was going to be a career lecturer. Carolyn offered some thoughtful reflection born out of her own experience. It was reassuring to know that she had faced challenges, yet managed to enjoy raising her children without sacrificing her career. Even more important, she was enormously supportive and encouraging. And when a scholar of Carolyn's reputation treats you 
not as a charlatan, but as a colleague and a peer, you can't help but to stand a little taller and think a little more highly of yourself. It was a vote of confidence that I sorely needed. As my one-year contract was repeatedly renewed, environmental history became one of my regular offerings. And when Carolyn asked me if I'd review major problems for a second edition, it made me think long and hard about all that I'd been learning about environmental history. What was working in my classroom and what wasn't? And how to go about teaching the course in the best way possible. That course continued to evolve and became a staple, contributing to the university's decision to create a three-pronged tenure-track position. 50% history. 25% environmental studies, and 25% women and gender studies. Ultimately, undoubtedly due in large part to a letter of recommendation that Carolyn took time to write on my behalf, I began that assistant professorship in the fall of 2000, just as my first book, Fighting Bob Will Fall at the Righteous Reformer, was published. Now, that monograph earned favorable reviews in scholarly journals and in the New York Times and won an award. Nevertheless, I learned that during tenure, I was expected not only to teach in all three of the areas that made up my position, but to publish in them as well. And so it came to pass that Carolyn not only contributed significantly to my success in the classroom through her scholarship and personal encouragement, and helped me to gain a tenure track position after more than 14 years as a lecturer, or as a road scholar, as I like to say, because I was always driving. Um, and helped, uh, 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 but also paved the way for the research that would ultimately broaden my scholarly reputation and cement my career. I found inspiration in Carolyn's groundbreaking article. Women of the Progressive Conservation Movement, 1900-1916, which included a sentence that resounded deeply with me. Quote, man the money maker had left it to woman the money saver to preserve resources. Way back in 1990, Carolyn had proposed to the Journal of American History that gender perspective be added to conceptual frameworks in environmental history. Of course, she hadn't just been calling for this, she'd been pioneering it, most significantly with her paradigm changing the death of nature. And I think we should have a drinking game where everybody has to take a shot every time somebody says the death of nature. <laughs> <laughs> Great part. <laughs> so, detailing the link between the uh, exploitation of nature and subordination of women following scientific resolution. And then came ecological revolutions, revealing how those broad philosophical ideas and theories about gender and environment could be applied to American history. Earth care, women and the environment, raised issues about the problematic assumptions of women as caregivers that further deepened my thinking about history. It also helped to shape, to shape my feminist consciousness. And those views were reinforced in reinventing Eden, the fate of nature in Western culture. Now, several of my early scholarly environmental history publications were co-authored with Marie Bolton, an American historian working in France. So our articles and essays were read primarily there and did not seem to be moving toward a cohesive body of work. My first chance to really build on what I had learned from Carolyn and reach an American audience came with an opportunity to contribute to Rachel Stein's edited collection, New Perspectives on Environmental Justice. In writing this essay, Women's Sexuality and Environmental Justice in American History, I found my niche. I would continue to use my skills as an American historian to demonstrate as vividly and as concretely as possible some of the core truths and ideas set out in Carolyn's groundbreaking philosophies that were generating exciting new thinking all around the world. And additional essays and uh, art resulted. Carolyn's insistence that gender has always had, always had a major impact on how Americans think about the environment and how they treat it and react to it revealed an important truth that I was determined to be recognized and appreciated beyond the academy. 
My first serious effort to engage a non-scholarly audience in meaningful thought about gender, environmental justice, and ecofeminism was to write an article that eschewed all of those terms in favor of more user-friendly language, less likely to intimidate or alienate the general reader. The result was the We Say What We Think Club. <laughs> Uh, rural Wisconsin Women and the Development of Environmental Ethics, published in the glossy, highly illustrated Wisconsin Magazine of History. Despite its non-scholarly venue, the article received honorable mention for the 2007 Alice Hamilton Article Prize of the American Society for Environmental History. I was so pleased by the enthusiastic readers' responses that the article generated that I followed up with a few more. Women for a Peaceful Christmas, Wisconsin homemakers seek to remake American culture. These works explain uh, both strengths and weaknesses of the assumptions Carolyn identified in Earth Care about women as caregivers for the environment. This is uh, Wisconsin's uh, League Against Nuclear Dangers to Power and Form Citizenship. They reveal as well the healing possibilities that emerge when, as she urges, Non-human nature is treated as a partner rather than an entity to be either exploited or stewarded. This is the most recent one. This is this great. Ada Howey, America's outstanding woman pioneer, playing the mandolin for her cows, uh, which resulted in tremendous milk production. Just saying, I can't believe it. Um, so I increasingly augmented the presentations I was giving at academic conferences with illustrated talks to whatever more general audiences would, would have. In 2002, I began teaching lesbian and gay American history at my Jesuit university, an experience I detailed um, uh, in an article for the Journal of American History. Becoming immersed in that subject matter led me to build further on the foundation established by Carolyn. I explored new connections within gender and environment in the essay, The Role of Nature in Lesbian Alternative Environments in the United States for the edited collection Queer Ecologies. And there's a wonderful, I have to tell you, there's a great little phrase in here talking about same-sex relations between animals to prove that this is unnatural. And the little, um, at the brand or whatever it is, is we're dear, we're queer, get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, that one. <laughs> so Karen's work inspired me to continue to bring to the historical record concrete examples of the interactions between gender and environment in the United States. But like many environmental and environmental historian before me, I was faced with students and a general public that seemed convinced that environmental history really meant history of the environmental movement. And a subset of that belief was that when such histories were devoted to women, that they should consist solely of biographies or vignettes of women environmentalists, women nature writers, or ecofeminists. So what was needed was a monograph that revealed how prescribed gender roles led American women to react differently than men to the environment and environmental issues, from Native Americans and the pre-Columbian period to the present, not just since the first Earth Day in 1970. Carolyn's many works, which range across time periods to engagingly demonstrate human and environmental relationships, served as an inspiration and a model. And that result, the result was my work with uh, Oxford University Press, Beyond Nature's Housekeepers, American Women in Environmental History, a finalist for the 2013 California Book Award. And one review noted specifically, Unger builds on previous studies of the environment by scholars such as Carolyn Merchant. <laughs> it arrived. <laughs> I also want to tell you the best thing about this book is that's my mother-in-law when she was at ranch camp when she was 16 years old. <laughs> so, yeah, I just I love that girl. Um, so Carolyn has also been my role model and unsuspecting mentor with respect to the types of scholarship she does. Her willingness to produce top quality reference works made me rethink my resistance to such endeavors. When I saw how user-friendly and stimulating her reference volumes were, 
I began to appreciate their importance to the field. So I accepted an invitation to write the, end, the essay on gender for the Oxford Handbook of Environmental History. Writing that essay renewed my veneration of Carolyn. Pressed to make the piece less eccentric, because that's all I know, um, I became more acutely aware of my woeful ignorance of environmental histories beyond the borders of the United States, and marveled again at the depth, but especially the breadth, of Carolyn's expertise. The fact that she produced the region-specific green versus gold sources in California's environmental history as well as this sweeping co-edited three volume, the Encyclopedia of World Environmental History, is a testament to her ability to create comprehensive studies at both the micro and the macro level. Having conquered my resistance to reference works, I recently co-produced with Christopher uh, McKnight Nichols, um, a companion to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. And again, the cover is the best thing about it. Um, Pulling together and polishing the works of others seemed a Herculean task, and my admiration increased for Carolyn's expertise and productivity in editing diverse works into a coherent whole. In the last few years, my focus has returned to my first love in history, the Progressive Era, resulting in the prize winning uh, Bell Follett Progressive Era Reformer. But Carolyn's imprint on my professional life remains indelible. Perhaps most significantly in my role as a public intellectual, I continue to try to bring broad recognition to some of the key concepts first revealed by Carol. Venues for my talks on gender and environmental history include the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, Town Hall Seattle, which is available on C-SPAN in their online library, uh, the regional offices of the Environmental Protection Agency, in 2013, in celebration of Earth Day, CNN featured um, on its homepage my op-ed on women's environmental leadership. I've spoken about women in environmental history on the news, um, on Public Radio International, uh, National Public Radio, featured on uh, KQED. I finally had my sit down with Michael Krasny <laughs> and great <laughs> moments. Um, uh, on the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Preservation Act. And of course, I spoke on KDFA in Berkeley. Uh, I gave the keynote at a, a LGBTQ conference out for sustainability in San Francisco the same year that uh, Time uh, ran my op-ed on the role of place in LGBTQ history, which um, led me to giving a talk in Birmingham, Alabama, on the history of gay bars, which you can also um, watch on C-SPAN. Uh, this fall, the Washington Post uh, ran my history-based op-ed on the tiny house movement. It is rewarding and exciting work that brings the importance of environmental history to wider audiences and keeps me ever grateful for Carolyn's sustained leadership. All who have contributed to this volume you know, we're putting together, of course, engage with various aspects of the myriad contributions of Carolyn Merchant. For me, that impact has been personal and professional affecting multiple aspects of my life, my teaching, my scholarship, my efforts to combine career and family. My children um, are now successfully launched. My son is a vice principal and my daughter is in law school, uh, hoping to pursue a career in environmental law. I now chair the department I told so many lies to get into. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carolyn's book has inspired some of my best things and empowered me to foster creative and critical thinking in others. Her, dis her, her disciples are legion, and we are all profoundly grateful for the depth and breadth of her work. It is a thrill to watch the ongoing ripple effect of her thinking on the field she has been so central in creating, to watch her important legacy unfold in my own life and in the lives of so many others, and I'm so grateful. Thank you. So much, Nancy. That was, that was fascinating. Um, we've got about ten minutes. Questions, comments. I know you want to know about that cover with my mother-in-law on it. So I'll tell you. Please. Um, 
when I was talking with the editor or the photo guy, whoever it is, the book designer, I said, all right, uh, let me tell you what I want on the cover. And he says, look, whoever told you you can't judge a book by its cover is a fat liar. The cover is the most important marketing tool we have. You may suggest, but we will decide. I said, okay, I want the caliber. He goes, well, that's pretty fucking good. Let's ask Carol. Did yeah. she select all these covers? <laughs> yeah, pretty much all of them, except for the Death of Nature cover. How did that come about? That came about because um, I, when I first uh, had the manuscript of the Death of Nature, um, it was a, a, a colleague at the uh, University of San Francisco um, said that you really should talk to uh, Ted Rosak, mm -hmm. and he was then at Hayward, which is now California, <coughs> East Bay, <coughs> and. So I sent him the uh, manuscript as it existed then. And he said, I will show this to my editor at Harper Collins, well, but then Harper and Joe, San Francisco. And that, um, at that time, was a woman, and she uh, then moved to Harper in Boston. But the person who replaced her was a uh, a fabulous guy named John Shop, S-H-O-P-P, -P, John Shop. And he was told by Marie Callahan, who left, this must be published. <laughs> <laughs> and so he worked with me. And uh, at that time, the chapter on nature as female was chapter four. He said, this must be the first chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and so I moved it and rearranged it, and he worked with me, and we got the uh, manuscript. And so then they published it. Well, the first edition was hardcover, and uh, I displayed that um, <coughs> last night. But then the paperback came out, and it was John that took <coughs> this cover for the paperback. And I just want to say that John Shop, over the years, I have not been much in touch with him, except I did talk to him and tell him this uh, symposium was going to take place. And he told me at that time he was quite ill mm -hmm. and that he um, might or might not be able to come. Mm -hmm. And I called about three or four weeks ago and the line was disconnected. And then I looked in the newspaper, or I looked online, and he had passed away just a month ago. And so I owe him, I owe him my career, <laughs> you know, for, for publicly taking on this book. And uh, uh, Harper Collins has said that they will keep it in print, and they have kept it in print ever since. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I owe a lot to, uh, to John Shaw. Th thank you for asking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Carolyn, I know you had a comment or a question for Nancy. Well, I just wanted to thank Nancy for this wonderful uh, collage of uh, <laughs> books and, and the ways I influenced you, but you have your own integrity and your own brilliance and your own research that you used to put together all of this. So well, I don't want you to give too much credit to me <laughs> when you owe yourself so much credit. Well, that's, that's of course, very gracious of you to say. And I do appreciate it, but I, I do think also that, you know, I always thought early when I was young, being a scholar was this solitary enterprise. It really does take a village. I mean, it really does. And I think that so much of what you've given to me, I like to think I've been able to, you know, to, to keep it moving. So it's really nice to have an opportunity to say, you know, yeah, none of us do this by ourselves. It takes, you know, for all of us, it takes, it takes a well, Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. 
And you know, I haven't seen you for years and years, but the, 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 when you came and spoke to my class, uh, it was taped. And for years, I showed that in class. So I have your voice in my head, um, and I can tell you all the little jokes. I've seen this over and over and over again. It's nice to get an update that uh, that has been right. Any more questions or comments? Up, oh, Elizabeth, and then at the back. Thank you so much, Nancy, for this beautiful presentation. And I, I just wanted to, to come in and maybe draw you out on your point that when Carolyn visited your class, she was also a, a mentor in your career and gave you um, advice and encouragement about combining career and young children. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's so important that you said that, actually, because still now, it's um, not encouraged for sure. You know, like that's going to derail your career. Um, if you're really serious, you'll just focus on your career. So I just think it's so important that you that you said that, and Carolyn, that you said that to Nancy. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to expand on that moment because I think it's really important still for young people of all genders to know that uh, those endeavors can be combined. Well, I think you're exactly right that, that that is important. And it was important to me that Carolyn didn't say, now you've really got to get moving on this and, you know, those kids will raise themselves like wolves. You know, this is like, you know, that, but I, but I also think that, um, I mean, I think a lot of us who, you know, who do have children, I mean, for me, they're, they were what saved me from just focusing on this all the time. It created some balance in my life, whether I liked it or not. And it worried me very much when they became adults. It's like, am I only going to work all the freaking time? You know, it's all because, like, you know, I didn't. That was my, you know. So I managed to get a, get around. Now that YouTube is invented, I can watch that all the time when I'm supposed to be working. But uh, but no, I do think that um, this idea that um, that that you know that, that Carolyn who was so enormously successful really encouraged me to to think about that balance and and I, I, that, that was a very important um, piece of encouragement and one that I also tried to um, uh, uh, encourage in my faculty as well one of my faculty members came to me very ashamed and said my, my wife is having a third baby I have to have another parental leave I said for God's sake don't apologize for this you know this is you know this is a wonderful you know, this is a wonderful thing but I think he was waiting for me to say three kids that's too much so, you know I said you know there's not like a limit on this you know it's your it's your life you have to decide but I think it's true that for men and for women there's still this kind of you know um, concern that you won't be perceived as sufficiently serious or dedicated and it's wonderful to have someone who model but that is not the case. Mm -hmm. I just want to comment, thank you for saying all that. Um, my two young sons, who are here now, David and John, um, when I was... <laughs> uh, when I moved out here to Berkeley, they were two and a half and five. And I got a part-time job at the University of San Francisco that and I was hired by an African-American man named Robert Thornton. And Robert Thornton um, had been a dean at San Francisco State. And there is a hall named after him, Thornton Hall. But when he retired, he came over to USF. And he uh, started a program, uh, an interdisciplinary program in the natural sciences. And I heard, um, I, I was recommended by somebody that I had been talking to about trying to get a job, because here I was jobless with two little kids. Mm -hmm. And they said, talk to Robert Thornton. And he said, the minute I saw your history, that you had done history of science and physics and philosophy, he said, I knew you were the right person. So he hired me. Mm -hmm. And I was part time for a, a number of years, and I arranged my life. <laughs> so I taught two classes on Tuesday and Thursday, the first at uh, 11 o'clock and the second at 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I left um, in the mid-morning 
uh, and that time, Ber Berkeley schools were on the 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, you know, the 9 o'clockers had their reading and then the 10 o'clockers had their reading afterwards. So um, I took the, uh, I, I prepared the lectures on Monday and Wednesday and I taught on Tuesday and Thursday. And then on Fridays, I did research and wrote articles. Mm -hmm. The articles by Carolyn Elton <laughs> turned my uh, dissertation into publishable articles so that by the time I was ready, they gave me finally a full-time job at USF and gave me tenure, which I then abandoned to come to Berkeley. <laughs> the death of nature got me tenure here. You know? Well, I, I would just add, when I was a lecturer all those years, uh, I remember my, I taught on Wednesday, and my daughter was born that evening. <laughs> and because I was a lecturer, there was no like maternity leave or, or anything. I just had one of my colleagues kindly said that she would teach my classes. So I missed three days. And then I came back. And so when my faculty said, oh, I have to take the paternity leave, I say, or paternity leave, or family leave, whatever it is, I say, for heaven's sake. Well, that's great. That's good. I'm going to be mad at you if you don't take this. You know, but this is so it, I'm happy to see that things are moving forward. There was a question back. Yes, yes. very briefly, and then we can mm -hmm. we'll move on. Mm -hmm. I'm just glad that Elizabeth brought up that story about childcare. I was at a lunch yesterday where Senator Elizabeth Warren shared a story about how she was about to give up her first teaching job at a law school because she didn't have childcare for her two young children. And so can you imagine where we'd be if we didn't have her voice in the Senate right now? Her aunt ended up taking care of her children for 16 years. But um, my question for you was, what's next? What's your next project? Well, it's to get out of being chair because I hate it. Um, and um, I do have a, a book I'm working on now, and I've done the research, and I have an agent for it. I'm all ready to go, so I don't have the time to do it. But it's a it's a juicy story about the the first two white men to be uh, uh, prosecuted under the uh, White Slave Trafficking Act. And um, so there's these two men in Sacramento, and they've taken up. I'll be quick. Uh, 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 they've taken up. Uh, they're married, they have children, and they've taken up with these two young single women, and they take them to Reno on the train, and they're arrested for um, uh, white slave trafficking. They say we're dirtbags, we're adulterers, but we, we didn't prostitute these women. And it becomes a big, 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 big case, and it ends up, they are both found guilty, it goes to the Supreme Court, they're found guilty, they serve time. And so for me, the question is, brings up race and gender and sex, and how much morality should government be legislating? How, how much can you legislate morality? How much should you? How much could you? But in a really juicy story. So that's it. That's what I'm. That's what I'm working on now. So in my ever expanding, you know, none of my books relate to each other. They're all kind of over the place. But that's that's what I am hoping to finish up with. Maybe being chair is the most important qualification for the job. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'm extremely well qualified. So thank you very much. in the audience, but I think that's fine. Ken, would you like to come up and... <laughs> and talk. Okay, so our final speaker for this session is Ken Worthy, uh, who is a research associate at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and lecturer at UC Berkeley, St. Mary's College of California, and NYU. Uh, his book, Invisible Nature, uh, Healing the Destructive Divide Between People and the Environment, was published by Prometheus Books in 2013. He earned his PhD at UC Berkeley in 2005 under the direction of Carolyn Merchant. All right, I'll move back. Thank you, Kate. All right, I, I started this week um, at the Chancellor's Award Ceremony for her awards for public service. And of the three or so <coughs> students, undergraduate students receiving awards, two were my students. And that was really an honor to see. But that actually, even though I got called uh, shout outs from them, it was not the primary, the honor was not the primary feeling I came away from that ceremony with. It was one of incredible humility 
because these students had founded, each one of them had founded, run, operated, developed multiple organizations on campus and off campus, serving uh, communities of color, serving disadvantaged people, feeding people, doing environmental justice work, etc. And I was just overwhelmed, and I told them that. I feel like a slacker <laughs> compared to what you're doing. And they're doing all of that on top of a pretty rigorous uh, undergraduate uh, coursework. So one of the students said, on top of all that, there was all this humility from them. One of the students said um, that his, his mother told him that humility is not some kind of special virtue you adopt. It's actually just being realistic about how much chance has come into your life um, and affected your life. And I'm feeling even more humility now here at the end of the week with all of these colleagues and mentors around me. People have been deeply influential to me, Carolyn Merchant, Barry Calicott, Holmes Ralston, uh, and others, and seeing all of the amazing work that people have been doing and seeing it all come together, especially out of just a brief idea that surfaced four years ago. And I like to draw connections in the classroom, and I'll draw a few connections here. Um, about four years ago, uh, in 2014, Whitney Baum and Elizabeth Allison and I were at the Association for Environmental Studies and Sciences Conference in New York. And Carolyn Merchant had recently um, run a one-day symposium to honor the work of her partner, Charlie Sellers. And I told that to Whitney. Whitney was standing there. And you have to know Whitney, you should get to know Whitney if you haven't already, in his inimitable, enthusiastic, joyous attitude. My hint was that maybe we should try to do something like that with Carol. But Whitney's response was, let's do a fest trip. Now, apparently he says that all the time. He's working a lot of it. But I, my response was right away, yes, and we only just then walked over and talked to Al, uh, Elizabeth, who happened to be right there at the conference, and she enthusiastically said yes. And then we, of course, didn't do anything for half a year. But <laughs> the following three years or so were pretty much, uh, that was a big project that we worked on. Um, and to me, it's just um, humbling again to think of how all of this has come together, not only a book that I think we can be pretty proud of, um, but also this symposium. And so but the next step I want to do here is to give some thanks. And I'm inspired <clears throat> in doing this by the graduation speaker at my PhD graduation here at the College of Natural Resources on the other part of campus where we were last night, uh, outside g and Hall, when our invited speaker was Chief Warren Lyons, um, a Native American scholar and chief. And he started his speech by giving thanks to all of the proper things you need to give thanks to from his tradition. And it took 20 minutes. <laughs> I can't do 20 minutes now, right, Kate? No, no, but you can do about, I don't know, 15 minutes? <laughs> But I'm going to give you an overview because I think that without giving all of the details of why he said we should thank all of these different entities and groups and categories, um, I think it's really instructive to think of, uh, of this because it grounds us where we are. We're here where Ohlone Native Americans lived for many thousands of years. And <clears throat> today we're also here um, embedded in nature, even though that's, and this is the theme of my work, even though that's not apparent to us. That's the way that Western philosophy and practices of life, phenomenological aspects of life, have made that, have divided up our world phenomenologically and made that dependence much less obvious, much less apparent. So I'm going to give you, just read a couple of quick excerpts. When the Haudenosaunee meet, whether it is a large gathering or a small one, we 
We have several greetings. We say to all the people gathered, we are grateful and happy to see you healthy and gathered here. And I am grateful and happy to see you all healthy and gathered here. And then we look at Mother Earth and we say, this is our mother, and we give a big thanksgiving for our mother with all of our love, because that is what mothers gather, great love. <clears throat> and we look at Mother Earth and we think of how she supports us, helps us survive, and keeps all life going. How wonderful, powerful, all-enduring is our mother, the Earth, and we give a thanksgiving for the Earth itself. And then we move to everything that grows on the earth, from the grasses to the medicines to the bushes. And then he talks about each one of these um, groups of things. I'm just going to talk, tell you what all of the categories are. And then we move to the trees, our grandfathers. Then we move on to everything that moves about and runs about in the forest with four legs. And then we move to what lives in the trees and flies above, all of the birds, a particular special interest of Carolyn's, um, obviously. And then we move to what lived, oh, excuse me, and then we move on to the waters of the earth, from the very beautiful springs to the seas. Water. And then we move on to the thundering voices that bring the rain and water, the earth and water to the people and water the plants and keep us alive. Great powers and great authority and great strength, the thundering voices. And then we talk about the winds, the four winds. There is a breeze here, it's very slight, but it's the wind and you can feel it, he said. And there was a breeze. And then we move on to our elder brother, the sun, who is here right now, who brings the warmth to the earth, who works with Mother Earth for life. Then we move on to our grandmother, the moon, who works with the female, who sets the standards for seasons. And then we move on to the stars. These are great wellsprings of knowledge that some of our people know and that most of us have forgotten. And we move on to the spiritual beings who look after us. And then to our messenger who came to us 200 years ago with a message of survival for the Haudenosaunee that has helped us to remain and be who we are today. And finally, to the giver of life, the holder of the heavens, all life, we give our last and most grateful and largest thanksgiving. This is who we depend upon we work with and work for. Um, and now we have completed our initial mission, as, and as you can see, it took time. As I said, I think it was about 15, 20 minutes of giving thanks. And if anyone wants to see that speech, I'll share it with you. It's up on our College of Natural Resources website. I first met, so what I'm going to do now is uh, give some more thanks to people involved in our project and to talk about Carolyn Merchant and her retirement a little bit and uh, her career and then talk briefly about my chapter in our book after mm -hmm. talking about our book a little bit, talk, uh, introducing it to those who don't know about it yet. So I've known Carolyn for 20 years. It was about 20 years ago, 1998, that you were running the Green and Gold Conference, was it, at Santa Cruz? Right. And I had just met you a little bit before that. And during that time, um, Carolyn has been a mentor and now a colleague um, and deeply influential in my thinking. And what I do in my chapter in the book is I talk about, uh, I try to extend the work of the uh, death of nature by contextualizing in history in a little bit as Baird does in intellectual history, um, Western philosophy, but also then looking forward and seeing how it grounds our disconnections, our, meta, our uh, phenomenological disconnections. Um, so, Carolyn. This is Carolyn sitting with some of the thousands of books that she's written. <laughs> so, we, uh, um, I actually was sitting in this, her office all last semester while she was on leave, <clears throat> occupying. Um, and so her office looks very different now. It's kind of the end of, it, of an era. Not really, because I don't really think Carolyn's ever going to stop working. Um, but um, one beautiful thing that has come about, and a lot of beautiful things happen around Carolyn, she gets things moving. 
Um, and one of them is that this, um, her extensive library, and this is just one wall of three walls of books in her office, um, has now been moved out. That's what it looks like today still, yeah. It's been moved out, shipped away uh, with help from some others to the Conservation Training Center Library and Archive at the Potomac River of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Museum and Archives. Uh, 92 boxes, several thousand books. Um, so remaining intact, really great thing. Um, so the other thanks I want to give are to all of our contributors. And it's been really wonderful. It's a great thing to have so many of you here today. I haven't met all of you in person before, many of you, but I really deeply appreciate it. I know Elizabeth and Whitney and Carolyn also, and uh, I really appreciate coming, especially those of you who come so such long distances. And we appreciate especially the work of people who have, we've pulled out of retirement and apparently this happens a lot. Um, great scholars never quite retire. And so um, we're thankful for all of that work that you've done with us. And also thankful for your patience with us. Because in many cases, we, we kind of overdid the editing. We had all three of us editing every chapter, many revisions of every chapter. So many of you had to be really patient with us. We appreciate that. Um, We, uh, the part about the symposium, we kind of tossed the ball on that. We didn't really drop it. We're grateful that we're able to round up some funds from the College of Natural Resources and other sources that are listed somewhere out there. And this would not be happening today without Julie Garecki's hard work. And she's over, right over there right now. Julie, thanks so much. <laughs> Significantly, the hard work of Carol, yes. who has jumped in and done a lot of this work. <laughs> I feel a little bit uneasy about the fact that we didn't just do it all and have Carolyn whisk in here and just enjoy it, but I'm really glad that you were able to um, chip in as much as you did. Um, let's see. So, um, Especially to those who've come long distances, as I said, um, we thank our editors at uh, Rutledge, Amanda Yee, and D Dean Birkenkamp. And I want to personally now thank editors Elizabeth Allison and Whitney Bowman because these are two of the most luminous and wonderful, lovely people uh, anywhere. Never mind in scholarship and never mind in academia. And it was just a real joy to work with them. And they're totally supportive. Hardworking, and on top of that, again, my humility um, in the amazing people I've been engaging with this week, they are brilliant scholars, really just brilliant scholars. So, thank you guys. It's really a great project. Um, I'm probably missing forgetting many categories of people and others. So if those guys, Elizabeth and Whitney, maybe when they speak, they can add in and help help me with that. Um, so here's uh, the purpose of After the Death of Nature, both this symposium and the book. The reason that Elizabeth and I and Whitney, I think, said yes immediately was these things had to be done. These are things that were obvious, projects that were obviously that needed to be done. There are such obvious things to do. So it's a retrospective, it's not just a fetch drift. Engages with Carolyn's work respectfully in the sense of that's the best way to respect, not just celebrating, not just saying it's great and awesome, but to really engage with it deeply. And a lot of the articles in the book do that. Um, and it's, we point out, it's a necessarily incomplete project. Partly because she won't stop writing. <laughs> <laughs> and while we're doing the book, several 
Carolyn published several more books while we were in California. And so, yeah. So that was a, uh, kind of a race that we lost. <laughs> but I think what we ended up succeeding in doing is really capturing multiple different kinds of dimensions of engagement with Carolyn's scholarship and engagement with Carolyn as a person that we have worked with. Many people like Nancy's wonderful chapter and Deborah Hammond also are uh, talking a lot about how they've been inspired by their work with uh, Carolyn. Here are the chapters of the book, um, um, Baird Calcott's chapter, because he deals with uh, the Iltis work, uh, Corpus Iltis, as he said, uh, is, um, comes first in my chapter. Uh, Heather Eaton, <coughs> Norman, Norman Wurzba, um, Elizabeth Holmes-Ralston's chapter, uh, Nancy Younger's chapter, Shepard Kreck's chapter. Uh, also, thank you to Mark Stoll, who uh, did wonderful work as well. Uh, Deborah Hemmings' chapter, Spiritus Sermon, maybe came the furthest distance here from Norway. Uh, great to have you here. And uh, his wonderful chapter, Carol Merchant in the Environmental Humanities in Scandinavia, showing the kind of geographic extent. We had a uh, con computer, contributor from Japan who wasn't able to uh, produce a chapter eventually, but we do have one from Indonesia, actually, who was inspired by, um, by Carolyn's work in her eco-feminist activism. Um, and uh, Laura, Laura Alice Watts here, uh, fortunately here, she said, it's no mistake, she was able to be here and wonderful chapter kind of grounding merchants uh, and her uh, talks about her uh, inspiration from Carolyn. Carolyn. And uh, Dewi Chandra uh, from Indonesia, Yakov Gara, uh, and Whitney's, and then Kathy Helen closes out. But we have, fortunately, we're able to get uh, Carolyn to write it out. <laughs> Carolyn gets the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Not unusual. <laughs> so let me look. Uh, Nancy has alluded to the uh, influence of Carolyn, Carolyn's work, and I'm going to give some, as we, this is from our introduction to the book, um, we have some data about this. Mm -hmm. Death of Nature Alone, obviously Carolyn's most influential work, has been reviewed dozens of times in the scholarly literature, uh, translated into half a dozen languages. There are more than 4,600 published citations in Google Scholar, which is an unusual for an environmental text. Um, organization, several, several journals, scholarly journals, focused uh, either entire sections or issues on invisible, uh, on, uh, excuse me. I have made that error before. Yeah, that's right. Someday, invisible mage will have this impact. Um, that's my book, which I'll talk about very briefly soon. Um, but, yeah, the organization, Environment, Environmental History, Journal of Environmental History, and ISIS all had either sections or entire issue devoted to uh, looking at the influence of the death of nature and engaging with it. But that's, she's not a uh, one song act. Um, looking at Carolyn's broader influence, uh, more than a dozen books, three new ones just in the last couple of years, more than 100 scholarly articles, more than 355 invited lectures uh, on three continents, 230 reviews and discussions of all of Carolyn's books have been published. The Web of Science has more than 2,000 citations of her works, and that's, the Web of Science is pretty stingy in its calculations. Uh, and the other end, Google Scholar is a little generous in its calculations <laughs> and says 10,000 published citations of Carolyn's um, books and articles total. And that's extreme influence, especially in environmental studies. Um, by the way, anyone interested, I think these slides will be available, right, Julie? I think they will be available. You can follow this link and get a full list of Carolyn's publications and other my chapter in the book, I really will 
just very briefly uh, mention an overview, which is basically, as I said, to situate um, the death of nature's theories and ideas in the broader intellectual history of the West a little bit, but also in the lived history since around that time, but actually connecting to before. What I do is I bring in um, I bring in um, Donald, the environmental historian Donald Hughes's concept of the Great Divorce that he says happened um, during the urbanization of the empires um, back in the Roman Empire before Persian Empire, etc., and um, all the way back to Mesopotamian Uruk, the building of city walls, the creation of cities. He identifies it as this time when connections that people had to their their natural environments um, became much less uh, tangible and much less it, it was removed from their experience. And so the question is for me in my research, how does that play into and feed into the possibilities for the death of nature to occur in the early modern period? And I argue in my chapter that that lack of experience with nature, and particularly with the elite philosophers and others, uh, enabled them to create these theories that um, farmers may not have come up with the idea that nature is, you know, something mechanical. So, um, what I do is um, then draw that backward all the way to Plato and, and explore how Plato and Aristotle and other Greeks, ancient Greek philosophers were constructing this kind of, uh, the kind of prototypes of the dissolution, the metaphysical prototypes of the dissolution of connection, including connection with nature, um, and, but not just connection with nature. From their elite positions, I, look, I do some sociological work um, going back to the Greek classical period to understand what the experiences, to try to understand a little bit about what the experiences of these philosophers would have been. And primarily they were the experiences of the elite people who most, most of the time didn't depend on actually working with nature. Their women, their slaves, and others were doing that. Are you telling me to shut up? Uh, no, I'm telling <laughs> you there's eight minutes left in oh, the session. Okay. But I in fact, in another minute, I'll keep for applause. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I should speak in another, how long? Another few minutes. minutes. Okay, yeah. all right. So, and then what I do is I look at these uh, conceptual dissolutions and I connect them to the lived experiences of this, what I call dissociation, the lack of uh, contact, not with nature only, because from a psychological standpoint, it's not just nature that you have to be connected to. It's the consequences of your choices, the consequences of your actions. And so I draw sort of the, this uh, conceptual disconnection. I connect it with actual lived experience. And I argue that experience is extremely important to be able to care and to be able to have an, an act an environmental ethic that is one of nurture and care for the environment and for nature and for others who are affected by our actions. And so I, um, I think I'll leave it at, at that actually um, and just mention something that I forgot to mention before, which is the book, the ideal was that the book was going to be available here, right? And if Carolyn had been in charge, it would have been <laughs> one book that she could not be in charge of. So, um, and not our fault entirely. Our publisher has a big backlog right now, Rutledge. And so the book's going to be available in August. And we have out on the front table, I think we do have the, um, the forms that you can use to get a discounted copy if you're interested. So let me just quickly run through. These are just some images that talk about, that de demonstrate um, this kind of uh, what I call phenomenological dissociation from the natural world and from your consequences you're creating. And here you have um, the drone operators who are killing people 
from Nevada. Uh, they're killing people in, in uh, the other side of the planet. And so this is an extreme example of the disconnect between consequence and action. Um, you're buying products full of palm oil. Orangutans are dying. We don't have that connection in our phenomenological experience of the, that. Nevertheless, there is that connection. Um, we're focusing on the virtual life, the virtual world, and we're looking at our cell phones, and we're buying cell phones and computers, etc. and e-waste processing in China is uh, ravaging the environment there. We turn on the light switch and coal-fired power plants run. So all of these, or nuclear disasters are happening. Um, what is present and experiential in our environments is completely different, right? In many ways from the his history of when we evolved as a species. And I argue that we don't really have the capacity to uh, uh, figure out how to actually do that, to engage with nature in a productive way when we're disconnected. And this is a key, also a key example, internet hunting, which doesn't still happen much, um, or maybe at all, but was a thing for a while. You could actually get on a website and shoot at animals. Um, and so, um, anyway, I should move on. That, that speaks for itself. In this example of the, uh, it, the kind of highly dissociated individual just clicking on food at Thanksgiving, no social interaction, no connection to the production of the food. The food comes from, through a tube. And uh, this is the artist Chris Ware is the cover of New Yorker 2000. And so also the tube taking away waste from this person. And uh, the scene is replicated millions of times over in, in New York. You can see there's the Chrysler and Empire State buildings. So I will just skip through some of this. Um, Sensuality becomes an industry uh, when it's taken away from us in our everyday lives, when we're focusing on the virtual life. Sensuality can be sold back to us. And there's this whole <coughs> ordering of space along this order of dissociation in which you have anatopism, for instance. There's multiple forms of dissociation embedded in our uh, spatial practices. Anatopism, this is a ski slope in Dubai where it's very hot, dry, and arid. It's a ski slope, an actual ski slope indoor where you can go. Uh, homogenization of space. I was appalled when I was uh, seeing, when I went to the Great Pyramids of Egypt and saw the Sphinxes looking out onto a pizza hut. Um, simulation, um, compartmentalization of space. Anyway, I think I should stop there. Um, and hopefully we'll have one minute, two minutes for questions. No minutes? Um, okay. I've got two minutes, according to my clock, if we don't need a few minutes to break. All right. Hannah, I'll let you feel the room. Okay. Carolyn. I want to thank you so much for all that and all the work you've done. I'm just overwhelmed and I'm thrilled. And I also want to say there is a bound copy of the page proofs now out on the table okay. along with the order form. Great. Uh, no, people can look at it. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. I wanted to also mention another thing I forgot. The order of appearances here today and the order of our names, uh, our editor's names on the book is arbitrary and meaningless. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> world through these massive systems and institutions of economy and so uh, an organization can, or a company can call their product sustainable and that may or may not be true and we don't have the ability to verify it 
easily, usually. We can engage other organizations for scholars who do that work to go into the palm oil and study it. Yet the complexity of the modern economic system is such that you'll never be guaranteed in the way that you might have been when, you, when your experience of the production of that thing you're consuming was embodied and phenomenologically present. And so what I, one of the things I argue in the book is this disconnect is a power thing in which we become disempowered because of our disconnects. And that allows, for instance, media outlets like Fox News Channel to come in and tell people that global warming is not happening because they don't have any direct experience of it. Um, and why we have fake news and real news and people getting confused about the difference, etc. So the disconnects really, it's hard to know. You probably, the palm oil that says it's sustainable, if it's third party certified, maybe has a very good chance of being sustainable but you have no guarantee in this dissociated world we live in. And there, there's a lot of greenwashing, there are a lot of labels that are not accurate. And um, there's a lot of labels created by um, the companies themselves. And so it's a, really, it's a real concern, it's a real issue. I don't know if I answered your question, but maybe we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. We're done. I think we're done. I'm sorry, we really have to move on, but I think there'll be lots of chances for discussion. Later. Thank you so much to the wonderful panelists today. I learned so much just listening to all three of you and um, look forward to the rest of the, the day. Thank you. Thank you.